All right, so uh, my presentation is going to be on um, electromagnetic acoustic transducers uh, or EMOTs. And so transducers, just starting really basic, convert one form of energy into another readable signal. Inputs are usually physical properties such as light, position, temperature, acceleration, and torque. And so there's two different kinds of transducers. There's active and passive. And active transducers require an external power source to operate. Um, and a really easy way to visualize this is with sonar. An active sonar system sends out sound waves and then listens for an echo back. Meanwhile, with passive transducers, you generate an electric current in response to an external stimulus. And so again, using the sonar example, the sonar system would listen for noises made by ships, land masses, mines, fish. So we're gonna be kind of in the uh, realm of active transducers with um, EMOTs today. Uh, so to compare it to kind of the traditional um, piezoelectric transducer, uh, the EMOT has, uh, it works on a kind of a different fundamental level, obviously. So a piezoelectric uh, crystal uh, creates ultrasonic waves when subjected to a voltage, and the wave goes from the transducer to the material. The one sort of catch with piezoelectric um, transducers, though, is that ultrasonic waves do not travel through air well uh, due to the large difference in impedance. And therefore, a liquid couplet must be used uh, between the transducer and the solid being inspected. And this is kind of the, uh, the catch to piezoelectric transducers. So meanwhile, with EMOTs, you have um, an ultrasonic wave. Uh, it induces an ultrasonic wave into a test field uh, using two magnetic fields. So the first field is a high frequency field generated by electrical coils. And this interacts with the low frequency or even a static field generated by magnets. And this creates a Lorentz force. And uh, the disturbance is transferred into the lattice of the material producing an elastic wave. And then the interaction of the elastic waves in the presence of a magnetic field induces a, cur a current in the receiving EMOT coil. And another cool thing about EMOTs is if you have a ferromagnetic conductor, you get this effect called uh, magnetostriction, and which is the prop and magnetostriction is the property of ferromagnets to expand or contract in response to a magnetic field. And so this sort of produces additional stresses that enhance the signal to, I mean, much, much higher levels than could be obtained by the Lorentz force alone. But again, the catch is you have to be doing this on something ferromagnetic for this effect to kind of aid the EMOT. So the advantages of using an EMOT compared to a piezoelectric transducer would be first that you don't need a couplet uh, required for transmitting sound. So this means it's really great if you're working with something super hot or super cold because you don't have to deal with um, evaporation or freezing. And also it can be um, integrated into automated environments more because you don't have to apply the couplet and then clean up the couplet. And so it's, it actually just becomes a quicker uh, way to do it. Also, since uh, you're impervious to sort of the surface conditions. You don't have to deal with things like roughness, um, oxidation or pollutants. You can inspect through kind of the surface and you're not hindered by all of that. And again, since there's no couplet, you don't have any refraction. No, Snell's law kind of does not happen. And uh, you're just the direction that the wave um, is entered does not affect the propagation. Uh, you're also, and I think one of the coolest things about this is it's the only practical way to generate a shear horizontal mode. Um, if you wanna generate a shear horizontal mode, you either have to use an EMOT 
high mechanical pressure or a very, very low density couplet. Um, and this low density couplet really impedes the scanning process. So it kind of makes all your results useless in many ways. So it's really like kind of the only practical way to do this. And then again, it's really great um, because of the antenna-like structure of the EMOT coil. Um, and then combined with the uh, excitation, it provides a really great way to select the frequency domain and you can really produce the wave you want and this is obviously important uh, for guided wave generation and interpretation. EMOTs do have some well really fatal flaws in them and the first is simply they produce a raw signal power much much lower than piezo electric transducers and so as a result, uh, more, uh, more sophisticated signal processing techniques have to be used uh, to isolate the noise from the signal. And that is a problem. But another thing to think about too is though, uh, though you need kind of more significant um, processing tools, it's actually not more expensive because EMOTs are kind of more expensive to get started up and then it's kind of a no cost after. Whereas with uh, piezo electric transducers, they're kind of cheaper, but then you're always having, having to put in money for couplets and uh, cleaning up. So they kind of end up working out, out to be the same cost. And then again, it's limited to metallic or magnetic products. Um, Using ceramic or plastic, using these non-destructive techniques is just, it doesn't work, or even if it does work, it's just so weak, it's not um, worth using. You really should be using a piezoelectric. And then the last one that's kind of interesting is the size. I mean, EM, EMOTs are just so much uh, bigger than the piezoelectrics of, Small scale EMOTs are being worked on, but uh, EMATs have kind of found their use in really big uh, presentations and uh, you start to lose a lot of the things that e make EMOTs great when you make them really small. So that's definitely an area that needs to be improved. And so like I said, it, you, it's used on a much, much bigger scale. So it's actually very popular for construction uses like with welding, pipeline and boilers, rail inspection. It can detect flaws wonderfully and it can tell you what it's uh, made up with. It's also um, being tested in ultrasonic communication right now and also uh, to tell the thickness of something. But again, these are, it's on a very, it's not practical to be on a very small scale yet. Um, and so here um, are sort of an example of some EMOT readings. And I just wanted to uh, show how you could kind of read this and see how it worked. So um, uh, here you have uh, the sort of the length of the defect and then the average energy. And you can see that the energy decreases uh, dramatically, especially between, I think, like maybe two and six millimeters of the defect depth. And then down here, you can see that as the depth of the de defect increases, you get a group delay, you get a larger positive delay. And this, uh, again, it kind of makes sense because you start, at, if you think of it as like a leaky pipe or something, uh, your, your, uh, your wave sort of goes out the leaky pipe and you kind of start to lose that energy and you start to see a delay because it has to go further to sort of reflect back. Um, so yeah, these graphs could be an example of like a leaky pipe or something. Okay, uh, that's my presentation. Don't really ask anything too hard. Thank you, that was exactly 10 minutes as well. So um, any questions for Elena? Yeah, I do have a question. Um, 
what is special about the shear horizontal modes? Oh, okay. So uh, shear horizontal modes, um, they can propagate uh, through curved surfaces uh, with uh, no energy, with really little energy loss, I guess I should say. So that's really kind of cool. And um, when shear waves are posed um, parallel to the direction that uh, they're used instead of uh, perpendicular for shear vertical waves, um, like I said, they, they propagate with uh, less uh, reflection and you get actually a very, very increased sensitivity compared to um, shear vertical waves. So you kind of get this wave that has a really high sensitivity, high beam, like get very good beam steering. And I don't know, they're just kind of really good for uh, detection and stuff. Thank you. Any other questions? I have a question. Um, <laughs> can you explain more about why, what, what is limiting the size? Like what component can't go small? Well, um, EMOTs need about one kilowatt of power um, to work, um, to just get that wave down, to get um, a reflected wave back that's big enough. And so the problem with generating one kilowatt of power is apparently you need some bulky coils and then um, a bulky electronic, so kind of scaling that. Uh, they have gotten an EMOT to work at around the size of a penny. Um, but again, so there's also like this sort of um, phased array effect that kind of vanishes if it becomes too small. And so just kind of keeping all of the properties of the EMAT that works when it's big, small, it's rather difficult. 